thank you all for coming. I knew we would have a good number of hardy northern souls who live out of the to, to brave the weather tonight. So it's a real pleasure to have everyone here and, uh, and to, to welcome you to the first um, up in the North at Trent 2010 lecture series. Um, I'm Julia Harrison. I'm director of the Frost Center for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies, just across the way. And uh, we're one of the sponsors of the, uh, uh, the North Lecture Series this year, uh, along with the NIND Fund from the President's Office, and particularly the Roberta Bondar Fellowship Fund, which uh, I'll say a little bit more about in, the, in, in a moment. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all, all of those. I'd like to thank uh, Trail College for their support, and I'd also like to welcome in particular our VP Academic Director for joined us this evening. Uh, a few <clears throat> uh, things to look forward to. One, um, we will have a small reception uh, right here next door, so nobody has to break the cold uh, uh, to get the building. We'll just open the, uh, the magic doors uh, following the lecture. And Dr. Uh, Leggett's book will actually be for sale. Uh, we have a few copies at the back if anyone wish to buy them. But it's actually, you should appreciate the fact that it's a hot seller. Uh, the University of Toronto Press it was out, Chapters was out, oh. and we managed to find a few copies through Amazon. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> congratulations uh, to you, uh, Elise. Many academics would like to say their books were actually hard to, hard to acquire through the press. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I particularly would like to acknowledge, uh, before I go any further, the work of Kathy Scholl, who's standing at the back, who's the administrative assistant for the Frost Center, who makes all of these things really happen in the end. So thank you, Kathy. Tonight's lecturer, Dr. Elise Leggett, is the third Roberta Bondar Fellow that we have had at Trent, and the Roberta Bondar Fellowship in Northern and Polar Studies um, grew out of a long-standing interest uh, and, uh, and some financial support for a Northern Lecture Series at Trent, and a few years ago was converted to a fellowship that actually brings um, a recently graduated PhD uh, to uh, who does work in the north of, uh, or in polar studies to Trent for two years. And um, part of the duties of the Roberta Bondar Fellow is to give uh, a couple of public lectures, of which this is the second of uh, Dr. Leggett's uh, lectures, but also to teach a course, and I'm going to be boldly promotional here about the field course that Elise is teaching through the Department of Canadian Studies this summer, and if you wish to know more about it, uh, the field school will be happening um, in, the, in and around the communities that she will be talking about tonight, tonight just uh, outside of, of Yellowknife. And that, that course is being run through Canadian Studies, who is also jointly hosting Elise as the Roberta Bonner Fellow. Dr. Elise Leggett is an anthropologist who approaches her work from the premise that history, place, and knowledge systems are central to understanding how we lead our lives, how we lead our lives. They are key to understanding cultural and social processes and very much key to understanding life at the, at the community level. Please come in, there's lots of seats at the front. <laughs> Elise Leggett is committed to the principle that doing research that addresses uh, community concerns and that will better inform academic and uh, and the world of the sciences more broadly and lead to new and insightful theoretical understanding. In 2002, based on her 10 years plus work grounded in the philosophy, <coughs> working with the Klincho, uh, formerly the dog rib, uh, she began her doctorate at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Her dissertation was entitled Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire on Becoming and Being Knowledgeable Among Klincho Dene. Now you will see uh, this is a slightly different title uh, for her book, and I'm sure we would be happy to talk about that and, and what publishers have to say about changes in Thailand. But basically, the book and her thesis explored, <coughs> um, at least wanted to explore what it means to say, as the elder di elders did that she worked with, to be knowledgeable is to be from the land. And what we are celebrating here tonight could be called the second launch of Elise's book, because last November uh, she returned to Pinchel territory in the Northwest Territories for what might be called the first launch. Elise was firmly committed that any inaugural event uh, about her work would be held back in the communities 
from, uh, with whom she had worked for many year, years and where she had lived. As she was planning, uh, making plans uh, last November to return north for this celebratory event, Elise also corrected me that what was going to happen in the north was in fact not a book launch. It was not about her book, but it was about celebrating the elders for whom so many years they had shared her stories with her. And based on what I heard of that event and the planning I observed uh, from her office in uh, Kerr House, many in the North came from far and wide for such uh, an important event. What happened around surrounding Elise's book in the community of Gamati was all about the elders, even if now several of them are now deceased. And I would hope that our event tonight is brought, has the same spirit that we are here, that noble goal that has always been central to her work is about celebrating and acknowledging the contribution and the work of, and the knowledge of elders. Elisa's doctoral work was built on her MA in anthropology, which she did at the University of Calgary, and her BA in archaeology, also from the same university. She has worked as an independent scholar and consultant for nearly 20 years in the Northwest Territories, much of her work with the Kicho, Kicho Witch communities, and she's worked on a wide range of projects, in which, some of which she will talk about tonight. She has also, in the North, uh, been a, a cross-cultural advisor on the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Impact Review Board. Uh, she has been the program research director for the Traditional Knowledge and Heritage Program for the Dog River Tree Camp 11 Council. She, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, she was acting assistant deputy minister of culture in the NWT. And she's presented uh, her work at, at conferences uh, in Canada, uh, across Canada, and specifically at Trent before she became a Roberta Bonner Fellow in Aberdeen in the US and of course in the communities in the North. As part of her position as the Roberta Bonner Fellow, as I say, she, uh, Lisa Leggett will teach a course. She's given uh, a series of these, these two lectures and also is very much interested in encouraging uh, and doing what she can to encourage student interest in the North at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, tonight to welcome Elise uh, to talk about her work, that, which culminated in her book, and, and about her approach to making sure what, was, what that book was about was about very much about her relationship with the community and with the people with whom she worked. So her book, Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, Knowledge and Stewardship Among the Klingshodene, and tonight she will share some of the stories that shaped uh, how that book came into being. Here we are. And I will actually, before I get into this, I will actually say that it, it was very interesting, the whole issue about the title. Because I really like becoming and being knowledgeable. Because that's, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about learning. It's about becoming something. And to have the title Knowledge and Stewardship is sort of um, nounish. And, uh, and so it was really interesting, but, but I was told by other people who have published that you can't change, the title is really up to the publishers because it's about marketing. So I let that go, and I got 34 pictures rather than 14. So, um, in fact, uh, a lot of the young people whose grandparents are in it, I think, prefer the, the pictures to the title. So, now I'll start. <clears throat> so I'm really happy to be here once again as the third Roberta Bondar Fellow. So uh, thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm dedicating this talk this evening to those participa participating in the I Don't Know More movement. It's a peaceful movement. Their issues directly relate to the main concerns of the Klinchu elders that I work for. I believe that the elders would feel hopeful for the future, watching the drumming and dancing, for the protection of their land, their treaties, and Aboriginal rights, rights, and for the water that is so vital to all life, including our own, and for the importance of consensus decision making. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't hear me? Okay, so tonight, uh, I'm focusing on tension between generations in the community of Gamatee, a flying community of approximately 350 uh, people.
Right off the bat, I get myself all muddled up. Okay, I've handed this sheet out to everybody because I use these terms because the ter these terms make more sense than trying to explain exactly what I mean every time I come to a concept. The first one is de, which is usually translated as land. It, 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 rarely have I heard of ground and earth, but that was in the Tincho Dictionary, so I did put it. But in fact, it includes absolutely everything. Um, you know, the, the northern lights, the wind, the water, all humans. And because everything has spirit. And so it's more than land. In the north, I watch people in Yellowknife using the word land in a different way because they've been influenced by um, the thinking of the Denny and the way they use that. But not, it's not true across, across the world. Kaul is a traditional boss or leader who has skill and knowledge uh, to care for others and oversee tasks. And it's usually a person who's uh, a, a come for the community or an event or um, hunting, ta hunting, going hunting or trapping. And they also use a word which I might use is, is kaute, which is a big boss. They're a person who has the ability and the knowledge and the skill to uh, care for larger groups of people and the knowledge. And these people often change given the tasks that they're, uh, that they're undertaking. Uh, Quitsi, as I mentioned last time, if you remember, actually originally meant the people who like to live in stone houses because the word quit is, is uh, for stone. And nowadays the younger people are using it, if you ask them what it means, the people who like to steal our rocks. But quickly it's, it's translated as uh, white people. Kincho is the place where the Kincho belong. And I think that's a really important concept because you can say, oh, they own the land or traditional land, but it's really the place where they belong. It has a different uh, feel to it, I think. And Yabati is a traditional leader with um, significant power, and a Yabati usually has a code to assist them. And there hasn't really been a Yabati um, around uh, since, they say, uh, since Edsel. So, that's what they say. And so, uh, tonight, again, I'm focusing on the tension in, a, in the community of Gamaji, which is a fly-in community of approximately 350 people. Now, this is where Gamaji is, which is halfway between Great Bear and Great Slave Lake. And Great Slave Lake is just north of Alberta. And you can kind of see that there. And these lines are traditional are trails that people used in the past for uh, hunting and traveling to the barren lands or, and also um, trapping and they still use them and every summer there is um, a canoe trip to the community that is hosting the annual gathering and that trip is called the Trail of the Ancestors. So people come from all the other three communities and travel to the community where the annual gathering is. And this year it will be in Bechico. So people will travel from Wati, Gamati, and Wapati down to uh, Bechico with the kids. And they use the, the trip to educate some of the younger people. Now, <clears throat> the gentleman over there is Monfui. And he signed the treaty in 1921 with the uh, Federal Treaty Commissioner. And he is a man that is remembered for that through the textbooks, and you, you hear stories about Mofui. But when the elders talk about Mofui, they also talk about him as a person who was knowledgeable and who liked to share his stories with the young people, and that was very important. He was seen, in fact, the elders wanted a trail of his, the Mofi Trail, protected as a protected area. And it's a bit tricky to try to protect a trail as opposed to a place in Canada, but they're still trying, and they wanted to protect that trail because it represented his 
curiosity about learning more. He was, he was known as a young man and he kept going further and further on the trail so he could learn more and more about Tincho Nike as well as the deaf. And he also took young people with him to travel on those trails so that they would learn and have the experiences that related back to their stories and their narratives. So, uh, Gamati is the first place that I worked with the Tincho where, and where I launched my book, but only it was for, as Julia said, to celebrate the elder's voice. Before I describe the tension and the solutions arrived at through sharing stories, let me first tell you a little bit about how I came to work with the Klincho elders. Since I was very young, I knew I would go north. It was never, I don't even remember questioning it. When I first moved to Yellowknife, I worked for a nonprofit that brought young people together to spend time with the Inuit, elders and scientists in the high Arctic. I then moved to the GNWT in Culture and Communication, where I chaired the Aboriginal Languages Committee and the Traditional Knowledge Committee. We made some headway. There are official Aboriginal languages in the NWT, and the GNWT has a traditional knowledge <coughs> policy. However, they have a long way to go, and they have not changed since I was <laughs> involved in that in the 80s. I mean, they've changed a little bit, and there's been some reviews, but they really haven't changed to uh, reflect what the people themselves want through the Aboriginal languages and the policy. I, I then decided to take two years off and take up a post in, with, the Art with Art of College, now Aurora College, during which time I taught Trent accredited university courses. At the end of that contract, Joanne Barnaby, uh, who was then executive director of the Denny Cultural Institute, asked me if I was interested in working with and doing research with the elders in Gamaty. <coughs> Joanne, by the way, wrote the foreword to my book. <laughs> so uh, you'll see what she has to say. In December 1992, I went to Gamaty, attended a meeting, explained what I understood they wanted, and explained what I could and could not do, and also what I would and would not do. One, one of the comments I made was, since I have never worked with you, I would like to work with both male and females, as I found in the past that men and, with, men and women often have different views and approach life in a different way. Well, that was the end <laughs> of the meeting. And it was, it was, there were people from all over the Clincho region because it was also discussions on self-government, so there was all kinds of people there. And <laughs> the elders started teasing me, and it was mainly associated with the fact that I knew the difference between men and women's approach to life. <laughs> and that was, it went on and on and on in the evening, and I just felt so completely exposed as I was standing up in front of all these people that I did not know. Um, but as time went on that evening, I came to understand that the, oh, sorry. As, at time, as, time went, as time went on, I came to understand that the elders from Gamaty remembered that as, bureaucrat, that as a bureaucrat I had gone to the minister, uh, with the minister to their fall hunt at Kusikati, the place where the Chipwan and the Tincho made peace. And one elder, Joe Migui from Bechiko, had been in a traditional knowledge slash science camp when my, that my, my eight-year-old son went to in 1988. Apparently, Joe Migui, who was in Gamaty at the time of the meeting that I'm talking about where they were all teasing me, um, remembered me and that I dropped my son off and picked him up and he remembered my son. And he told the elders that my son could listen to the elders and that he actually liked to watch them rather than asking a lot of questions. And therefore, as a mother, I may be okay to work with their children and grandchildren. So I did not get my job with the Tincho because I had education. I got my job with the Tincho basically because I had actually been to one of their important places and my son could listen. 
so I'm indebted to my son for the next 10 years of my life. What I found interesting about that situation was not only how I was accepted to start, I mean that didn't mean I was accepted as a person, I was just accepted to be given an opportunity. I found it interesting that, that in that situation my son has a different last name than I do. But they remembered me from some of the meetings I attended and from my son. And that I had gone to uh, Gosukati. And I realized, that's when I really realized that the Klinsho people know more about the folks in Yellowknife than vice versa. So while we're still on this slide, and you can see where it is that it's on the Barrens. This is the place where Enzo, and I will be mentioning his name again. So there was Mofui, was, a, was an important Kaude, and Enzo, who was seen as a Yabati, is an important, he's an important leader as well. This is where he made peace with the Chippewan, very specifically a Keicho. And how that occurred very briefly, the story is very long, it would probably take about four hours for an elder to actually tell you all the details. They would travel, he was traveling through this area because his family spent a lot of time in this area. And he said to his brothers and his wife and the other uh, members that were traveling with him that he had had enough of a Keicho coming in, stealing their furs, often taking women and um, um, he was tired of the fighting, and that if everybody kept fighting, nobody would be left. There would be no uh, Chippewan, there would be no Klincho if they continued fighting all the time. And so he sat down with the people who were following him and said that he was going to go back and make peace with the Keicho. They talked for a long time. He listened to the folks who were following him and who were his part of his band, and some of them decided to leave and because they didn't think he was making the right decision, and other people went with him. They went back to this spot, and it just so happens that Edsel's sister was married to Katafi, who was Slavy, who was the cowl of Edsel. <laughs> so it doesn't just happen. So he snuck into the camp, <coughs> snuck into their tent, and had a talk with Katafi and uh, his sister and said that he was going to come back to the camp and make peace. Now his brother had uh, the ability to to control uh, weapons and so and Mofui or Edso was known to have the ability to uh, control people's minds because he was a very positive uh, person. And so he went back and they set this whole situation up when the hunters came back uh, that were working and were following uh, Keicho. They controlled, uh, one of the brothers controlled uh, those guys and, and Keicho sat with his back, you know, Ezo sat with his back to Keicho and Keicho kept saying, uh, I'm going to rip your heart out and I'm going to do this. And this is from the Keicho perspective, remember, I'm telling the story. And he kept saying things that, you know, they would never, he's going to kill everybody and he was going to take all his furs and all of these things. And, and, and so just sat with his back to him and, until his voice became calmer and calmer and calmer. And then Edso faced him. And by that time, Akecho was ready to talk about peace. And so for the rest of the time, they talked about peace and they decided that they would have peace between their nations for all time, and that if anybody interrupted that, that they would be punished. And then they danced, a drum dance, all night and the next day. And I have had the privilege of dancing on that circle. It's about this deep, and it's <laughs> very wonderful to dance there with the full moon and uh, fire. So that's the story, a very brief and summary story of Edson. It's much more interesting to listen to it from an elder, of course. So in January 1993, I had been at this meeting 
uh, in Gavati in December 1992. I went away for Christmas. I came back in January 1993, and I started I started working for the elders. First through the Danny Cultural Institute, Joanne Barnaby, because they had raised money through um, uh, the shirt a shirt round through the Arctic Institute with Dr. Joan Ryan and also the Gordon Foundation to start this project for the elders. And then as an employee uh, with the Dog Herb Treaty 11 after a few years of working uh, with them through the Danny Cultural Institute. In 2001, I decided to go to University of Aberdeen, Scotland to do my doctorate in anthropology under Professor Tim Ingle. I wanted to struggle with what it means to be knowledgeable, if you say you're from the land. Since I was five years old, <clears throat> I have been trying to figure out what it means to be knowledgeable. I remember the day my Scottish grandfather uh, told, us, told us stories about Scotland, and in his doing so, I asked him to tell me a story about the mountains west of Calgary. I could see them. He said, you will have to ask them. They know this land, not me. And he was pointing to Tsitsina people who were traveling past our house. I have continued to wonder what it means to to know, and I'm always interested in how others can be so clear about what it means to be knowledgeable. So this is kind of a lifelong journey for me, I think. My book, Walking the Land, Feeding the Fire, discusses how I came to understand a little about what it means to be knowledgeable if you say you're from the land. How one becomes knowledgeable, how one is defined as being knowledgeable, and how stories from the past become one's own knowledge. Now, this is part of the celebration, giving the books, 40 books, to the oldest child of the elder I worked for. If they were no longer living, if they were living, then I gave the book directly to them. So this person is Charlie Don, and his father, as well as Charlie Wittrati's father, were were instrumental in helping and pushing the chief to get money for the elders to start the program on traditional governance. And uh, Louis, his his mom was part of the, the the elders, the elder group that oversaw the whole program for ten years. So they're all the oldest child of the family. I wanted to celebrate the elder's voice. Celebrating the elder's voice uh, was supported by Joanne Barnaby. That's Joanne there. Um, and she's talking about the importance of the elders and what they have to say. And George Barnaby, they're not related. <laughs> uh, and George was on the council, or on, on the board of the Denny Culture Institute when the elders asked for the money. And Joanne was the executive director. And they really, um, really never gave up going after money for whenever the elders wanted to do something. Those two were, uh, and George lives in the Satu, which is quite a bit further north, it's around Great, Great Bear, and Joanne lives in Hay River. Rita also spoke to the importance of the elder's voice, and Rita was one of the first researchers, community researchers, that the elders hired in 1993. These are a few more researchers that worked on the program. There's Rita again when she was much younger. And Sally Ann, who was also chosen by the elders. And uh, later on, Georgina came and joined uh, the, the documenting of the elder story and Bobby uh, gone. And in fact, Bobby and Sally got married. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting sometimes in our office when they were having um, both intimate relationships when they feel, you know when they were getting to know each other as well as fights. So <laughs> both happened. And this is when we were out and um, Nancy Ka and uh, Awa, uh, the elder there was 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 talking to the young people that worked just for the summer. They were summer students, and the elders would take them if they were getting good marks and interested in the past. 
It was they they held that up as a that, that was the elders, and these were the young people that 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 came along with us for that summer. Now it was it was really interesting too at that uh, in Gamachi in November because there was a geoscience forum happening in Yellowknife, and everybody goes to the geoscience forum. And what happened while that was going on? Native communications from Yellowknife came to film the elders. Uh, CBC radio and television flew in to help us celebrate the elders. We just had to say we we were interested in celebrating the elders through my book, and uh, we didn't uh, trick them as they were willing to celebrate the elders' voice. And here we have Snooky Catholic, who is from Putsuke, uh Chippewan community, uh, taking a picture of. Uh, Liza Mandla, and she's now 92. And uh, this is her, interestingly enough, in 1994. And to me, she doesn't look much different. <laughs> she looks really happy. L uh, Liza continues to set up, have young people set up her, cat, her tent every spring, and her and her sister go out and spend several weeks there. They come in before the black flies come up. They like to avoid those black flies. <laughs> So, Liza, so what uh, Snooki did was she followed um, Liza around a little bit because she is the oldest woman in, in the community. And then uh, she went to the school and she interviewed some young people and asked them what they thought about uh, my book launch and uh, celebrating the elders and what one young person said and she filmed it was, if we don't learn it, if we, we high school students don't learn the elders' stories and the elders' knowledge and have the experience with the elders, our knowledge will be lost, potential knowledge will be lost. And so there's a whole group of high school students that are quite committed to um, carrying on. And if you're interested in what she did, it's on uh, North Beat, CBC North Beat. It's still there. Now, Several CBC radio called me in, in Gavity several times and really wanted me to talk about my book. And uh, so it was, it was interesting to get them to start thinking about, about the elders rather than, rather than the book. And they kept asking me why I launched my book in Gavity. And I said the same thing as I was, I've been saying to you is, I started working there. It was the first place I worked when I worked with Clincho, and I spent most of my time working with Clincho in Gamachi. And this is true. However, it is also true that I love them. I love them for pushing me to think in a different way about what does it mean to be knowledgeable. I love them because they were not afraid to show affection and expected me and the other researchers to share our own personal experiences so they could learn from us. They had expectations of us to give as much as we got from them. Now, <clears throat> did I just miss one? Oh, here it is. Um, this is Father Posha and uh, Jimmy Martin, and Father Posha once told me that he learned more about love from the Kincho elders than he ever did from studying theology uh, when he was young. And he said not, just, not because they preach, but because the way they behave on the land, and because of the way they respect um, other people. So that was, that was Father Posha. And Jimmy Martin, is the elder that the book is dedicated to. Jimmy Martin has, has died, and his wife came to the launch, and I presented the book uh, to his wife. But it was dedicated to Jimmy Martin because he was the person who was instrumental in moving that one project on traditional governance in Gavity to being a regional program. He's the one that went to the Grand Chief to say, you know, it can't just be happening there. We have to have, well, he probably told a story. In fact, he probably didn't say it that way. I only heard it after it happened. Suddenly, um, it was much bigger. And he wanted 
elders and young people to be working together all the time in all four communities, not just in one. And Jimmy Martin is the nephew of Mofi. Right? And he traveled on those trails with Mofi. He was one of the people who learned from Mofi about the importance of young people. And uh, he wasn't, except very indirectly, involved in any kind of any of the land claim agreements or advising the chiefs. He was interested in young people and getting those stories documented so that even if that even if the young people couldn't hear them directly from them they would hear their ancestors voice on a recorder and that's something i just i struggle with as a a person doing that work but that's what they wanted um the other thing i'd like to say about jimmy martin is um a little embarrassing for me, but I think important for everybody to hear is that that when we we got all the money that came into these projects, we we did for fundraising, of course. I mean that happens in universities as well. Um, they usually have a regular job too, and the money, the people who worked on these projects depended on on the money. You know, Georgina has six kids and nine grandchildren, she's the only one that was working. So she depended on her paycheck. And there we were, near the end of the year, and two reports had to be written, <laughs> mostly by me, with their help, of course, but, you know, to get, to get it out there. And I was getting really uptight, because I was worried about the money coming in, I was worried about getting everything finished. And so I did say, you know, maybe we need to tie this part of the project up and get the reports written and then apply for more money for next year. And I was sitting there and then I said that and they went back doing their work because they weren't finished. And Jimmy Martin noticed that I was, you know, getting speedy, I wasn't listening, I wasn't even hearing. And <laughs> I was just thinking about, you know, how is everybody going to get paid and getting the report in and, and uh, all those things. And so Jimmy Martin said to me, or he said to everybody, let's just stop. And then he turned to me and he said, if you get ahead of us, we're all in trouble. <laughs> so, so it was a, like a wake up call that maybe I should just sit and relax and, and, and do it. And then he went on to say, they told us it was our project. We thought of the project ourselves, and it was. All of these projects were from the, from the elders. And so we're, going to take, we're not going to finish it until we do it right. And so um, it was, <laughs> and they just kept doing it. And we did get the report in late, and everybody's checks were a bit late, but that they did it, and we, of course, we haven't finished yet, so it's not like you ever finish this work. So, um, back to the story behind the book. Uh, in 2004, I was talking with an employee of a diamond company about, the, about traditional environmental knowledge, tech, research with Aboriginal communities in Northern Canada. During this conversation, he made the comment, a passing comment, that the Denny elders consistently voice how they would like to see tasks done. He felt that the ever-present tension between generations created difficulties for industry. It was after this conversation that I decided to write about the tension between generations in Gamaty when I first started in, 19, in the early 90s. And it's the reason I wrote chapter six, is <laughs> because of that passing comment about how just because people have tension, it makes it difficult for industry to develop. So, um, and it was after that conversation I decided, as I said, to write about the tension between generations in Gamaty and to show that there may be, may be tension, but once solutions are found, cooperative activities are undertaken. The tension was triggered by a breakdown in the Danny Métis claim, negotiating 
negotiations resulting in the lifting of a moratorium on land development in the NWT, allowing a diamond rush in 1990 and 91. The, the, the situation in Gamete helped me to understand the importance of consensus, honoring agreements, respect, and who has the most skill and knowledge to lead an activity and protecting the environment, and how important the elders are in guiding the younger in situations like this. Over the years, I watched Clincho, Clincho people consi carefully considering who to follow when thinking about the task that needs doing. They did this whether there was, they were leading a hunting or trapping crew, negotiating a land claim with traditional and federal government, or finalizing an impact and benefit agreement with industry. In this case I describe here the task was to maintain personal autonomy while re-establishing self-determination through land claim through the land claim process in the context of an intense diamond rush. <laughs> Let me give you a little more background. The Denny Métis claim negotiations in the NWT had been underway for nine years before the federal government withdrew. That was between 1981 and 1990. In 1988, the Denny Métis Secretariat and the federal government had an agreement in principle. In April of 1989, approximately 24,000 uh, miles of land were withdrawn for protection from development pending land selection through the land claim process. <laughs> In 1990, the Denny Métis leadership took a, a complete comprehensive Denny Métis land claim. The Denny Métis, it gets, after you say it eight times, it gets a little <laughs> tongue tied. And they took the agreement forward for ratification at the joint Denny Métis assembly. But the agreement was not ratified. Rather than a ratification, a, a resolution was to negotiate, went to the negotiating team. It called for renegotiations of several portions of the agreement and a possible and possible court action to reinforce Aboriginal and treaty rights by the federal government. Representatives from the Gwich'in and Satu Deni opposed the motion, and therefore they withdrew from the process and initiated steps to negotiate a re regional claim with the federal government for themselves. They were interested in, in getting, getting it finished. In November 1999, the federal government informed the Denny Métis Secretariat that they would no longer negotiate with them. The land freeze was lifted. Soon after, the, soon after, the diamond rush began. So they lifted, and then all of the uh, prospectors came in. So much of Clinchonekha was staked. Prospectors laid claim to land with little consideration for the people who lived there. At the time, um, and, and, and during that time, when there was that intense diamond rush, there was actually people, prospectors, staking land adjacent to people's houses in the communities. So, here we have Klintonica, uh, and here we have the stake. <coughs> so, you know, it looks different. And this gentleman, Pierre Mantle Jr., um, he's 92 now, but um, during this whole process, and after we had started the project, he came in and he asked us to go with him. Uh, he wanted to take us to this island. And uh, so we hopped in his boat, and we thought we were going out for a picnic for, for a little while. And so uh, Rita and Sally, the one who fell in love with Bobby, and, uh, and I went with Pierre, and he took us to this island. It was probably about an hour trip uh, down the lake. And he, we got out, and he walked over to a tree, and there was a little metal plaque there. And it was, a, it, it was that island was claimed. It was staked. And he looked at, at me, and it was translated, and he said, where do I take my family now? What do I do? And he looked so dejected, and he looked so sad, and like I'll never in my life
forget the look on his face when he asked that question and when I had already seen what was happening with that diamond rush. I mean, just complete um, unawareness of they were on land, Kincho Neka, the place where the Kincho belong. So, and the nice thing about me here, he kind of looks sad right there, but you know, that's because he's really old. He continued to have his humor, he continued to dance, he continued to tease people, but he kept asking, where do we take our families now? I mean, of course, people say to him, well, it's a free country, you can take them anywhere. But that was his family's place. It was where they, when they were traveling up and down in the Tilly, the road between Great Bear and Great Slave Lake, where they would always stop when they got, got around Yamachi, before there was a community there, for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. Where do I take my family? That's where we belong. So, as that was happening, <laughs> the Diamond Rush, the Clincho leadership traveled to their communities to discuss, and also the breakdown of the Denny Main Tea, uh, uh, negotiations. The Tincho leadership traveled to the communities to discuss what communities, what community members would like to do. The consensus process lasted two years, 1991 and 1992. The elders were concerned. They, like others, had worked to protect Tincho Neka through the land claim process, and now the federal government was getting what they wanted to develop Tincho Neka. In 1991, while the elected chiefs were discussing with community members and looking for a consensus on process, the elders in Gamity had their kawo, uh, Gene Mutradi, you saw his son, <laughs> who was in his 80s, ask Chief Peter Arrowmaker for a project to document traditional governance. In December 1992, when funding was secured to start the uh, traditional governance project, the Tincho chiefs had attained a mandate from community members to negotiate the land claim and a self-government agreement. On December 6, 1992, I attended a meeting held in Gamaty, and James Washi, a land claim negotiator, explained their strategy and what they wanted. Now that was the that was the meeting where I first went and I made you know, I walked right into the, the teasing about men and women. That was that meeting, that same meeting, I'm just telling it in a different way now. <laughs> so, so the, the negotiators were, ta were talking about what they, they had heard through this consensus process, process and, and therefore were talking about the strategy and what uh, they wanted to accomplish. So community members, including elders and band counselors, repeatedly stated that they wanted their knowledge heard so that they could be part of the decision-making and management process affecting themselves and all that is part of the Plincho Nekha. The oldest elders were also saying that they wanted their narratives documented so that their descendants would have them to think with. These narratives include information about Yamasaw, um, who gave relationship rules to all beings, and these and all they also wanted recorded the old laws that continue to be applicable. How Edso made peace with Akecho, how Monfui traveled with young people so that they could learn, and how he signed Treaty 11 in 1921. How mining uranium at Ray Rock, which is uh, just located south of Gamaty. It was a uranium mine in the 50s, caused destruction and disease and continued to pollute the water, how federal legislation affects Clincho lives, how Justice Berger had the ability to listen, resulting in a pipeline moratorium. It was evident that the elders were particularly concerned over the protection of water, as all life depends on water. After a few hours of discussion, the newly elected chief, Henry Gaughan, announced that the Kincho elders would oversee the recently funded traditional governance project. When I returned to the community after Christmas, January 8, 2003, no one was talking about either self-government or traditional governance. I wondered what had happened, as it, was as it had clearly been important 
I noticed that although the band councils band council had held meetings which were were open to the public, few community members attended. I also noticed that few of the band councillors or the chief attended the Friday night hand games or Sunday night drum dances. To me, the community felt tense, but the silence as well as the apparent withdrawal could have been due to any number of reasons of which I was not aware. In fact, it could have been because of me being there. I just was, I didn't know because I hadn't been there enough to, to figure it out. I spent my time visiting and listening, and after two weeks, I happened to be visiting Jean Matrati with Therese So, who's the lady right there. And at the time, at, the t at this time, she was the community lay nurse. She's now retired from her position at nursing and has taken up snaring rabbits. <laughs> so, and traveling to the, their community. During our visit to Jean Watrati, the Kau, the elders Kau, uh, Jean explained to Therese that the chief and council had changed their minds. Chief Gon now thought that the research fund should be used to develop a self-government model for the negotiating team and that the elders should act as advisors. The elders themselves, Jean explained, still wanted their own project to ensure that the Tlinchonaka the and the Deaf would be cared for in the future. If the young people didn't have the knowledge of everything and why the Tlinchonaka was important, then they wouldn't have the information or the knowledge to protect it. They were looking for ways to continue guiding young people in the future. They wanted their descendants to have the information car carried in Tisho narratives and knowledge that comes from experience associated with those stories. They wanted the young people to be able to think. Interestingly, interestingly the tension was focused around Kao Jean Matradi and Chief Henry Gong. And you have to remember that the Kao was a traditional leader who was selected and followed because of his ability and his knowledge and his, ta and his ability to task. The chief is an elected position and chiefs are defined through the Indian Act. Now that they have their Tincho land uh, claim and self-government agreement since 2005, it's defined there. But at that time it was defined through the Indian Act. So the, the tension was focused between Kao Jean Mutradi, the elders Kao, and Chief Henry Gong. And whether or not the elders should act as advisors for Kao, who teach and guide young people. The elders told stories of Yabati, the big leader with special abilities, Kao Day, all of whom had, who had learned from their elders and whose greatness had to do with the ability to lis listen to those who follow them and to act on what needed to be accomplished. The elders emphasized how Yamazo and his brother learned from their grandfather, listened to people during a time when all beings were the same and established social rules. Similarly, Enzo had learned from his father, experiencing and listening to others, discussed the problems and then created peace with the Keicho. Mofui had learned both from his father and his uncle, listened to the people, his uncle and bishop, and listened to the bishop too, and then made a peace agreement with the federal treaty commissioner. And so, the Amazon and Mofui are seen as having ended periods of chaos. They had the intelligence and, and skill to rebuild harmonious relationships. Both factions told the same stories to encourage community members to think about the role of the elders and whether or not the research fund should be used for traditional governance or developing a self-government model. They emphasized different aspects of living life in the right way. At time, as time passed, more community members spoke about the importance of elders documenting the stories and spoke about the importance of supporting the negotiators who should have the elders to advise them as they developed a self-government model. And appreciate that this whole process, even though they were using stories, was a consensus, was, was building consensus in the community. It wasn't sitting around a table. It was happening in their homes, 
and out of the hunting camps and everywhere they were they were talking about it. So these are the elders that were involved in this. They're missing Andrew Gone and Jean Watrati because they had passed on. So on February 28, 1993, Jean Watrati announced at church that a feast for the elders would be held at his home. Jean asked Therese to come and bring me. 28 of the 30 elders attended, while other members of the community, children and adults, dropped in, sat, listened for varying lengths of time. Andrew Gaughan spoke, for the first, spoke first, explaining the issue that needed discussing. And since Jean Matrati was involved, it would have been inappropriate for him to speak first, because he was part of, that, of the, the tension. So Andrew Gaughan uh, spoke first. Then each of the elders spoke. Although most of the discussion was not interpreted to me, they did tell me that the chief and counselors were out of the community on important, on important business and did have Therese summarize the story of Yamaso Edso Mofi. It was basically the first time I heard it, but did not necessarily remember. After a lengthy discussion, during which they continued to use narratives to make their point, the elders concluded by saying that the four oldest elders in the community, Marie So, who is right here, who was I don't know if you remember Louis O. He was the smiling one I was giving uh, the book to. Uh, Madeline Drymaker, right here. Uh, Marie was 86, Madeline was 85. Andrew Gaughan, who spoke first, is right here. And Jean Lutrati is right there. And they were both 83 and 84, would direct the traditional governance project, and they would invite the chief to sit with them. Now, I'm just going to take it a little aside again. This particular picture um, I put here because it's really important that you go to the person who know who has the most knowledge whenever you're trying to understand something. And Rita, and this is Belinda, her daughter, who now has two children. And Rita asked a question to Marie and uh, Madeline during one of when we were sitting around having coffee at Madeline's or tea. And she asked a question and to, and I cannot remember what that question was, but it doesn't really matter. And they said to her, well, you'll have to go and ask Mona, because she was there and she was older. She was 103. These guys remember are in their 80s, but you have to go to Mona to find out the truth. So, so we did. Yeah. So they had heard the story, but since she was still alive, they wanted to hear. It. They wanted her to hear it straight from her, and so. Um, so, so the next time there was the annual gathering in Bukwiti, we we went to visit to visit Mona, and then Rita also found out that she was related to, to Mona. So it was it was kind of a nice a situation. But the point is that you have to go to the oldest person. <laughs> so back to the issue in, in the community. They then oh yeah. So there we were sitting in Jean Wittrati's house. They selected the four oldest elders, and then they turned to me, and this was after several hours. They, you know, this, this took all evening. And then they turned to me and explained my responsibilities. I was not to write anything down. Now, you have to remember my training, in spite of the fact that I got the job because my son could listen. My training is anthropology. Yeah. We write field notes. Without our field notes, we feel like we're not doing our job. So they asked me not to write anything down. And I honored that. So I had to find other ways to 
remember. I mean, I did write, sometimes I did write notes down, but also most, a lot of the stuff was recorded. So um, that was okay, but I had to actually listen and I had to find ways to remember. It was very interesting because when I actually wrote my dissertation, I forgot lots. And it was almost like the act of writing, you lose your, you lose your memory. It's a very interesting experience for me. But I had to sit and pay attention to how these elders remember everything. And they remember by telling stories over and over and over again. And adding their own experience to the story so that it becomes theirs. And so I had to, if I wasn't, I mean, I did, in fact, share what I was experiencing with others. And they didn't mind that. But I also played it over in my brain so that I would remember it. I told myself stories. I made myself listen to myself about what I experienced. But it also meant that I had to get out of the house. Because <laughs> I couldn't be doing field notes all the time, so I had to get out of the house and actually share what I was experiencing. And, and be honest about that. Like what I was struggling with and, and what was confusing me. So, they told me I couldn't write anything down until they gave me permission. I was to train people of their choice in the skills I had learned from university. Now, Rita and Sally both had about grade three education. So, um, but you know what? They knew the stories and they could think. And I'll tell you, I would rather work with people who know how to think than know how to read and write. That's another thing that I, that I learned of that. And that doesn't take away from reading and writing. I'm just saying that it's, it was an honor to work with people who could think. Um, <clears throat> so that was two things. I was to oversee the taping of the stories to make sure it was done properly. And I and the community researchers they chose were to ensure that they were not translated. Now this is a bit of a struggle now, 30 years later when everybody wants to translate it. Because they wanted the young people to hear the stories in their own language and to work with people who know. And there's lots of uh, uh, women and men both who went to residential schools who can speak English, French, and uh, Kincho. They wanted them. That doesn't justify residential schools, by the way. I'm just saying that, that, that they know three languages. They wanted the young people to work with individuals who knew both English and Kincho to learn the stories, to understand the concepts, the clinical concepts, which are very sophisticated and very abstract, and learn the old concepts, not just learn them in English, because the word death is translated as land or ground, rather than everything has spirit. They also wanted me to fundraise for them to go on the land with the young people, uh, so that they could tell them stories. And I also was supposed to tell them stories of my experiences when I was away and returned just like other community members do. <laughs> that often felt a little... <laughs> but I did. I did it. We started work. Because I was in their community and I believe that if I'm going to do my job, then I need to respect. And if I can't do that, then I shouldn't be there. Somebody else can do the job. And I, I blew lots of things, so don't, I'm just telling you the good parts here. So at a public feast a few days later, Chief Gone informed the community that he would, he, has, he had been sitting with the other three chiefs from the Kincho Nation and members of the negotiating team, and they had decided to select one elder from each of the communities to advise them on land claims and self-government. Harry Simpson was the one chosen from Gamete. Now, Harry had been raised by Jean Trotty's family <laughs> and had married Andrew Gunn's daughter. So, <laughs> so um, but he was younger, so um, he, didn't, he didn't say much. And he, he also came and, and sat with the elders that I was working for. And, uh, and um, he, he rarely said anything. He was learning, and he took that information back to the negotiating team, so indirectly, the chiefs, the, the, or the elders in Yamati were in fact advising, but they had their own project, and they used Harry to, to advise, if that makes sense. 
it's complicated. The traditional governance project turned into a program overseen by elders from all four communities, with Jimmy Martin, Mofri's nephew, as Kaul. The elders continued to focus on documenting narratives that would help the young in the future. They documented stories on caribou migration and the state of the habitat and place names, plants, and medicine and, and all the things that they thought were important. It was and continues to be a privilege to work for and with people, the elders, elected leadership, and community members who know exactly what they want and aren't afraid to work through tension and difficult times. Merci, thank you. <laughs>